if you have a utility meter like this on That's the side not of supposed your house, to you can get I, paid I to go solar. For hang on, hang on. Let's let's try this again. Good morning, Tokyo, and welcome to. Uh, actually, I didn't really think about this. I don't normally I say the episode, but uh, welcome to uh, an experimental little thing. Uh, because Star Trek Starfleet Academy, uh, after years of being stealth announced by Alex Kurtzman and being talked about by Alex Kurtzman, just kind of assuming that we all knew what it was, uh, Star Trek Academy has finally been announced by Paramount+. Plus. Um, and I figured, like, ten minutes before I went off to work, what, I like, I was thinking about... Do I try a short? Do I try a, um, like, to make a video? I, I don't know. And I was like, what if I do a little live stream? Like, a test, uh, hopefully get some discussion, and just some little stuff. Because we do, it's not just Star Trek Starfleet Academy is happening, right? That's what the short was that this thumbnail is from. Um, thank God I keep all of these archived. <laughs> um... But there's a little bit more information about the setting and stuff, and I thought we could talk about that. Also, today's engine hum uh, is the Defiant, because uh, Red Squad went on the Valiant, which was a Defiant class, and I've realized that getting engine hums for Starfleet Academy streams is going to be hard. Hello, Alex. Alex has just arrived. I decided to do an impromptu stream because of the Starfleet Academy stuff and i didn't think you'd be home for like an hour uh i wasn't supposed to be home but i had no children today mm. alex um drives a like for yep. a bus company that takes care of like local kids getting them home to school i didn't know how specific they wanted to be but yeah that probably sounded weird without any context um no i didn't physically have any crotch golf. but yes today we're going to look at this article, which is linked in the description of this live stream, um, from Trek Movie, Star Trek, Starfleet Academy, and it's got some quotes. We've also got Memory Alpha, so I can check some things like directors. Fun fact, if you scroll up higher than right here, um, there's spoilers for what I'm pretty sure are the last episode of Star Trek Picard, um, is in the last one to air, not episode 10. So I now know things about Picard. I probably shouldn't. Um, I have. That's good to start off. I've not seen Picard yet, because I review it tomorrow. That means I watch it tomorrow. Um, I'm snuck over Lego. That's how this works. But shall we get in? Um, Starfleet Academy. Well, let's. Is where will. What do you think it is? Yeah. What Starfleet you... Academy mm -hmm. is going to be about a fledgling person. Who wants to be a star officer who wants to get on the Enterprise going through the Academy? It's going to be like a young version of Kirk or Wesley or of Jean Luc Picard! It's probably, other than the fact that it's at Starfleet Academy, none of that was probably accurate. Jean Luc Picard! Um, but, I completely forgot what I was going to say. Oh, yeah. Um, Good thing you don't face camera I'll see you get flagged immediately. Star Trek Starfleet Academy is um a show that myself and I think a lot of others have kind of had some trepidation about um word. which isn't like when Lower Decks came out was announced rather uh, up until it aired actually I was kind of cautious about that as well like I'm not at all saying Academy can't work like, with Lower Decks, I wasn't really sure if you could do basically the Orville, but it's actually Star Trek. Um, you know, the little scenes we were getting and stuff. I was never sure until I saw it. And this is another show where I'm not sure if it will work, and I'm not going to be sure until I actually see it. Um, because I don't think I have literally ever seen a depiction of Starfleet Academy that I like. Um, hey, the Wesley Crusher episode wasn't bad. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't bad. The um, very first time we see it in TNG. Um, <laughs> it's... <laughs> the dog is excited that Alex came home. Um, it, I specifically scheduled this stream so that it wouldn't start when you got home. 
Um, but yes. <coughs> My fear with Academy, and a lot of fears I've seen online, is that it would basically essentially be um, like a stereotypical American high school. And that that's what Academy would be. There'd be no. all those, like, cliques. There'd, there'd be, like, the jocks, the nerds. Like, not necessarily those groups. No, the cliques are just what they want to perf- be, a, like, a perf- the, the, what, Oh, that? Like, so the divisions? Like, yeah, the, the divisions. Science. Science. You could do that. That would be what they are instead of, like, the cliques. Yeah. Like, these are the ones who want to be but captains. My, my fear's always been that if you did Academy, it wouldn't be, um, a... It wouldn't be Starfleet Academy in a utopian, like, world. It wouldn't be the, you know, Starfleet Academy. It'd be an American high school. Um, no. I, actually, I actually really, like, I instead think, of cliques, you have the divisions. I think it would also be, like, an excellent way to show how racism can affect younger people. Because we know that how racism affects older people. They do that all the time, but, like... Accidental I, racism because you were raised with racism. Like, I don't, maybe somebody makes a thing about the Klingons and dudes are like, no, we don't say that anymore. I don't know why you went straight to that, but knowing what I do about the setting of Starfleet Academy, um, actually, yes, I was about to get into, I think, um, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. They is don't. Is it going to be cartoon or live action? Uh, we don't know. It should be a cartoon. I would guess live action, it but we'll, look, we'll get into all that later. Um, they don't say this is 32nd century, but they say somewhere in here, um, yeah, our campus will be reopened. No, wait. For the first time in over a century, our campus will be reopened, which um, all but confirms it's 32nd century, or at the very least after the 25th century. After the 26th, even. What era um, is that? Is that young? You don't know it. Ah! It's like 800 years after Picard. Ah. Um, so Spock's still alive, theoretically. <laughs> no. But... Mm. Um, I didn't like that answer. They only live for like 200 years, you know. <laughs> no. Spock lives forever. Got it. Um, the... <laughs> You've derailed me. <laughs> again um you're welcome so yeah i think actually that's a clever way to get around um that potential problem because 32nd century academy isn't the you know sort of this isn't earth after several hundred years of utopia this is kind of a federation that's just finally stabilized after like a hundred years and isn't quite like it's it's rebuilt its foundations it's now going to just kind of exist not really rebuild itself but like we prove it can can prove it can continue and um and so that doesn't necessarily mean you can just make it a cliched american high school oh uh, you can make um, it a cliched japanese high school but i it does allow for there to be more kind of roughness in Wiggle Room. And even what Alex said, maybe the species don't really get along. Um, if you had, of course, we don't know what happened to Teller Prime, the Tellerites, because, God, you never do. But if you could even have the main cast be like a human, a Vulcan, an Andorian, and a Tellerite. A human, a Vulcan, and a Klingon walk well, into a bar. No, the founding members... The bar is ran by Whoopi Goldberg. The founding again. members of the Federation, it, like kind of that symbology of... These the are the mean girls of the no. School? These are the founding members who like came together all those centuries ago to build Wait, the federation. What if they were the mean girls of the school. Let me finish my thoughts. No. Um, they kind of came together to build a federate the federation all those millennia ago, and then now in this kind of time of rebuilding, they have to learn how to maybe interact with other cultures and stuff again after being kind of distant and separated. You you can definitely have more freedom than maybe what was always the classic problem under Gene Roddenberry, is that none of you humans are ever allowed to have interpersonal conflict ever for any reason. Shut up and go write me a script. Um, so, you know, I I'll have to see if it actually see it before I know if it works. But I'm also in the minority, yes. But I'm also glad that someone's picking up the 32nd century um, after Discovery concludes next season. Um, I, I love the setting. I love the look. 
Um, I'm I'm actually quite enjoying Discovery after it went to the 32nd century. Um, I, it's yeah, I'm I'm happy someone's picking it up. Jonathan Frakes came out um, a little while ago, which that's that's I phrased it poorly. That makes it sound like he was gay, but. Um, Jonathan Frakes, he said that, like, don't expect any more 32nd century Star Trek. And I'm like, you're a director and, like, yes, an actor, but not in this century. Would you really know, like, actually? Why why would you know? <laughs> um, if anything, I was like, either you're saying that because someone told you not to say it because they were going to announce Academy, or you're just kind of talking out your ass, I guess. <laughs> like... Maybe he just didn't think it was going to happen. Um, but shall we actually get into the article then and see where this takes us? So yeah, they confirmed the Academy. Um, the series will follow the adventures of a new class of Starfleet cadets as they come of age in one of the most legendary places in the galaxy. <laughs> I suppose not in the 32nd century. <laughs> um, arguably Disneyland. one... Yeah, that's exactly it. They're gonna Disneyland survive the burn. Um, Disneyland will outlive us but all. But the show's planned to go into production in 2024, implying, um, I imagine this is taking over from Discovery, like probably air 25, 26, because um, Discovery season five isn't gonna air till 24. And, of course, it's in the 32nd century. It's going to kind of continue off, probably with Tilly. You know, we'll have Tilly in this show. Um, so I imagine this is the Discovery replacement. And especially with Prodigy existing probably around that time. Um, with how long it takes to make, I'm sure it will. You know, this will be like an older. Um, probably, I'd imagine it might appeal to all audiences, unless maybe they're saying that Strange New Worlds now. Strange New Worlds is kind of the flagship. Actually, now that I say it, that makes sense. But I would imagine, you know, we'll get um, shit, Girl Scout cookies. A, a teen to young adult, like, you know, high school, college age, kind of focused um, Discovery vibe. <laughs> Discovery-ish vibe. Discovery adjacent. Um... Which, again, I'll just have to see if Academy works. It's I'm, it's a show I'm going to be... I don't know if this is going to work until it comes out, and then I'll be like, yeah, that didn't work, or yeah, that worked. Or even worse, I'll go, I still don't know if this is going to work. Um, so here's how the show is described in the official release. Wait, is this not the official release? Hold on real quick. <laughs> For anybody who it concerns, Girl Scout cookies are now in season. Nathan can't have them because vegan, but... Um, Star Trek Starfleet Academy, will, which, by the way, is following in the uh, age-old tradition since Enterprise of trying to create difficult-to-Google scenarios with your titles. Star Trek Enterprise, Star Trek 2009, um, I mean, Star Trek Lower Decks has ambiguity in it. You know, is it the episode? Is it the show? Now, if you want to Google the episode, it's... It, look, I... <laughs> it's gonna be one that makes googling things about the academy difficult we'll introduce us to a young group of cadets who come together to pursue a common dream of hope and optimism of course that sounds great just let me see let me see how you execute it uh under the watchful and demanding eyes of that's a weird way to spell tilly they will discover what it takes to become starfleet officers as they navigate blossoming friendships explosive rivalries that's interesting. You could have species who were uh, enemies during the burn. Um, or even just, like, I think Andor Andoria was kind of, like, seclusionist and I don't want to just say racist because um, we really don't know much about Andor, but they didn't like outsiders um, having, like, an Andorian kid. You know, I, that would be interesting. Again, having this right after the burn, but right, right when the Federation's kind of, like, stable enough um it is, is a great idea for academy like that's pretty much the other than like the founding of the academy around enterprise or like right after the federation this is basically the only place you could have put it in my mind um first loves I, so yeah i i would guess that's it's kind of like probably a high school like a harry potter age 
group. That's kind of what I imagine. Harry Potter, but instead of magic, it's science and also trans rights. That's kind of like that. I mean, that's so, I'd love that, actually. Uh, and a new enemy that threatens both the Academy and the Federation itself. I did... Hmm. I did not see that line the first time. Um, that, to me, kind of says a few things. I would think Star Trek Academy, by nature of the structure of going to an academy would be episodic um nowadays probably like deep space nine episodic you know there's a there's running threads but episodic um a new enemy that that's weird because for one it's another kind of universe ending threat or at the very least federation ending threat it's basically the same thing i guess um that that makes me worry a bit. I, I feel like an Academy show mu doesn't really, like, need that. I feel like maybe Prodigy gives you the kids saving the world. I mean, for, like, a high-level description. Um, that that gives me trepidation. But everything else is kind of like what... That, that sounds like what I'd expect from an Academy show. This makes me wonder if you've really learned your lessons about stakes and... It'd, it'd be amazing if Discovery Season 5 does well. The one that's not about a universe-ending threat, and then they take that and go, hey, maybe we don't do that all the time. Um, so here's some interesting stuff. Kurtzman will be showrunner, um, uh, co-showrunner. So again, I think Kurtzman, he's a busy man. He's juggling all the plates. Um, I would imagine he's not super active in the show, but obviously he does have a voice. I do believe he is co-show running Discovery. Um, and that's a reaction that I, a lot of people are going to react to this sentence. Um, I'm more concerned about everyone else. So Noga Landru, wait, Landru is in, did you hire Noga Landru specifically because their name was Landru? is in that TOS episode where the everyone worshipped the computer Landru. And that Lower Decks episode where everyone went back to worshipping the computer Landru. Um, ooh, th no, this is interesting. Creator of Nancy Drew um, adaptation, which is a um, younger... It's not like Prodigy Kid. It's like an older kid's detective -y novel. Um... And writer on Sci-Fi is the Magicians. I do not know Sci-Fi is the Magicians, but let me just check, because I think this tells us something about target age demographics. Um, do, 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 the Magicians on IMDb. If I can just quickly see. After being recruited to a secret academy. So yeah, this is probably like a hidden world's. Harry Potter esque. A group of students discover that the magic they read about as children is very real. So yes, a sort of hidden world Harry Potter trans rights kind of um story. Trans rights? Which again puts Academy th this is what they're going for. They're going for is is there something other than Harry Potter I can use? Can we, Percy Jackson, why not? They're going for like a Percy Jackson age um yeah, you know, hopefully they become the next Harry Potter so that I can reference something that's not Harry Potter, but uh, I do doubt it. Yeah, there are no Tagalogs available. Um, but yeah, th this tells us a lot. This is a teen to college target demographic show is what I'm reading between the lines here. I have seen neither of these shows. Actually, I think The Magicians, when I was just on IMDb, was rated pretty highly. Uh, which is promising. Do, do, do. 7.6 out of 10. Eh, I don't actually know what the average one <laughs> kind of rating is, but that kind of, that feels right for a teen to maybe early college show is like a 7 to 8 out of 10. Um... And a joint statement from the two showrunners. Admission is now open to Starfleet Academy. Explore the galaxy. 
usually not at the Academy, presumably. Captain Your Destiny! For the first time in over a century, our campus will be reopened to admit individuals a minimum of 16 Earth years, or species equivalent. Oh, that's an age! The first time I read this, I thought that was, like, the term. And I was like, wow, that's a long time to spend at the Academy. <laughs> um, who dream of exceeding their physical, mental, and spiritual limits... Bajoran? I don't know. That's a. We'll get. We'll come back to this. Honestly, I'm waiting for the sentence to end so I can read into it. Who's va who value friendship, com camaraderie, honor? Mm, honor's a. Honor's an interesting word that inherently doesn't really have good or bad connotations. It's just like a very broad concept, and in practice, usually exists in. Um, or is, like, most common in kind of the warrior societies in quite negative and destructive ways. And so I always react kind of like, mm, to the word honor. I've dishonor talked about- on you, dishonor on your cow! I've talked about this before, um, on reviews. And devotion to a cause greater than themselves. Um, some things I noticed reading this, th the, again- our campus will be reopened, which uh, for over a century as well, which to me implies this is Earth. This is the Earth Starfleet Academy, right smack dab next to San Francisco with its Schrodinger solar panels that may or may not be there. Um, they went to where the Academy was in Discovery in Season 3 because there was that big tree. Um, I don't know if that, the Academy was actually there. Presumably, Earth repurposed the building in, like, downtown San Francisco in the centuries um, between the burn and now. But I, I'd like that. I'd quite like to see Earth. We didn't really get to see Earth. Um, I mentioned this as well, I think, in my review, that there were some kind of people who thought Earth was dystopian from what we saw. But I'm like, no, no, no. Earth itself seemed like still kind of the utopia, the United Earth that, you know, Enterprise might have known. It's just isolated and, like, extremely isolationist. That's, like, the difference is it's it's a utopia in a bottle now instead of in a galaxy. Um, but I like that. I quite like Earth's bound just after the burn, kind of exploring, exploring there a little bit. Um, and then not too much else of interesting or species equivalent is interesting uh you know, yeah that's the minimum age so um i've always kind of wondered about that how do you determine this is it just like every federal when you join the federation do you have to pick an age for all species on your planets and be like these are the legal ages you can do things um i've always wondered that it's like a it's a very solvable problem but it's one i've wondered about the coursework will be rigorous. The instructors among Tilly and their respective... <laughs> that, that didn't work. The instructors among the brightest lights in their respective fields and Tilly. And these, those accepted will live and study side by side with the most diverse population of students ever admitted. That is a very surprising claim for the 32nd century. But um, I imagine in universe it's wholeheartedly inaccurate. But it's telling us, the audience, that, hey, there's going to be a lot of aliens. This isn't just humans and, like, the token trill. I don't know. This is going to be, you know, aliens. I'd, I'd love... Um, I'm just imagining I, when my parents would watch the Macy's Day Parade when they, like, made it required that you had to have a person of color. We'd find the token colored person at every float. It was surprisingly easy. We would, um, I had a thought. God damn. Oh yeah, if I, if I was writing Academy, I would, I'd really like this idea of framing it around kind of a human, Vulcan, Tellarite, and Andorian, you know, the founding members. Um, that's how I'd write it. Um, that's how I'd frame it. You don't even really need Andor in the Federation necessarily. Um, they could be, I'd like They're it. Trying to make fetch happen. But you could have an Andorian. Um, I don't know if you'd want to limit yourself to four main characters. I'd imagine, again, as much as it loathes me to keep bringing it up, something like Harry Potter, um, where you had, like, 
your three main cast, like Harry, Ron, and Hermione. But then you had loads of supporting cast. You know, you had your teachers. Um, I might frame it like that. And, you know, I, I don't think four is too much harder to work with. Especially maybe if you make one of them a couple. You know, they mentioned love. That way you kind of have two main characters and a like the other two are always together. So they're kind of like one character. Um, you'd need at least three, surely, for all the divisions. But, like, you could have tactical science, command, and ops. Um, is this what Lower Decks does? Am I just realizing? No, no, Beckett and, um, Boimler are both command. But, um, I would love that. I love that idea of, like, the second founding of the Federation, so to say. Um... Today, we encourage all who share our dreams, goals, values, and Miss Tilly to join a new generation of visionary candidates as they take their first steps towards creating a bright future for us all. Apply today! Latin! Um, yeah, a lot of that, pretty standard. I kind of just highlighted the bits that we're talking to the audience. It's kind of, it's nice that they kind of do it in like an in-universe, you know, little flavor text thing. Um, that, I do like that. Alongside Kurtzman and, oh, that's not Landru, that's Landu. You guys, you should have told me, I said it wrong. Um. Nathan, I have a very important task for you next week. Yes. You need to take me to go buy Girl Scout cookies. Look, we'll talk about this later. Um. It's very important to my mental health we go get Girl Scout I didn't want to check. Because they don't sell tagalongs online! This Noga Land Landau um, does not appear to have worked on Star Trek. Hey, look, though, they've created this page for Starfleet Academy about bloody time. Um, yeah, they don't even have a link to their academy. I missed the announcement by one day, though, apparently. Um, it's, it's amazed me that this page has not existed on Memory Alpha for years since this was initially announced. Section 31, by the way, does have a page. Um, so alongside those two, the Academy show will be executive produced by... I'm gonna go with Gaia Violo, uh, the creator of the Prime Video thriller Absentina. Uh, I should probably Google her, but let me just take a quick look. Um, I mean, yes, that kind of looks like a, <laughs> a thriller. This doesn't look like a... After being declared dead in Ensentia, an FBI agent must proclaim her family, identity, and innocence when she finds herself the prime suspect of a string of murders. Yes, that doesn't really feel Academy-related, but let's take a look at, um, at this person. Absentina, in from the cold, and Star Trek Academy. That is what it says on IMDb. Um, so yes, a, a rather new person by the looks of it uh who also wrote the series premiere uh also executive producer are aaron barriers here is where we play the game where i put a bunch of people into memory alpha uh you do come up uh star trek producer secret hideout did you work on anything i liked <laughs> uh he was co-executive producer on the first season uh and executive producer on the second season of Picard. So the one that wasn't great, and then you got a higher position on the one that was a pile of poo. Um, and co-executive producer on the first season, and executive producer on the second and third seasons of Lower Decks. Which has improved with time. So, I mean, yeah, you know, who knows what you personally are responsible. But um, this is someone who's written for Star Trek before. And I would say there's probably more good than... There is more good than bad in that list. Um, exact producer on Prodigy, Strange New World. So it looks like this guy does a little bit of everything. Um, Jenny Lumbit, Rod Roddenberry. Ooh, let's come back to that name. That is a name I know. Jenny Lumet, uh Second, se second and third seasons of Discovery, while second is, I have often cited, the worst season of television I've ever seen, and the third was better. <laughs> and consulting producer, whatever that means, 
on Picard's first season. Not the worst one. Uh, episodes of Short Treks and Discovery. Ooh. Executive producer on Strange New Worlds. Which episodes? Did I like them? Um, I hope it's not some of the ones that I will cite as the worst episodes I've ever seen. Runaway Children of Mars. Children of Mars is exceptional. Um, that is promising. Runaway. Uh, that's the one. Uh, yes, the food fight one. Um, I don't remember much. I think it's all right, but anything like in this era gets bogged down from being part of early discovery. Um, but this, I like seeing that. Um, Lumet doesn't show up. Do you not show me who writes these episodes? Uh, yeah, that, that would take too long. Now that's promising. Rod Ruddenberry. Uh, I didn't know he actually worked on Star Trek. If you do not know, this is Gene Roddenberry's son. Um, he, he is the chief executive producer at Roddenberry Entertainment, a company through which is producing a lot of the newest Star Trek series. I did not realize he was this involved in um, Andy relieves Star you Trek. of your duties of having to take me out Girl Scout cookie <laughs> shopping. We're, me and her are going to go together and make a day of it. That's nice. Um, I am noticing, I don't know how many, like, producers and stuff you should have on a show, but this feels like a lot. Um, Rudenberry Tainment, Discovery, Short Treks. I'm also learning that apparently, like, everyone does everything, which is probably why there are so many producers, because there's no way anyone can work like, fully work on all of these shows. Ah, uh, uh, here we go. You were an executive producer on Discovery since the second episode and produced all of the live-action short tracks. Hey! I mean, there's a lot of good and a lot of bad <laughs> in, um, in that range of Discovery. And I think this last person... John Weber... Uh, except produced on Discovery since the second episode and produced all the live action short treks again. Um, Social Academy will be produced by CBS Studios with Secret Hideout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me just skim. Navigate the rigors of the Academy and Brink of Adulthood. Yeah. Um, Chief Marketing Officer and Head of Paramount Streaming. Hmm. Inter introducing new characters. I'd hope so. And compelling stories, I'd hope so. Uh, this all-new original series will... S is it really... <laughs> I mean, they made it in its original, but at this point, is Star Trek really like an original series? Uh, will serve as a fantastic addition, I thought that said addiction, to the franchise and Paramount+, Plus, bringing new generations of viewers and long-term Star Trek fans alike together to enjoy the next chapter in the universe. Um, this is a bit odd to me, and I do think it is odd in general to have Academy and Prodigy at the same time, um, which especially with this description feel like they're doing really, like, basically the same thing. But I think the logic is that kids and that teen to college age, there, I, there's not really much overlap. If you're watching Academy and Prodigy, it's because you're already a Star Trek fan. And so this is maybe getting in the different age groups, um, you know, two different generations trying to pull them into into Star Trek, into Paramount+. Plus. Um, that might be my guess. But as someone who is watching both shows, I think this this they feel like they might get a little too closely related. And especially if there's a big quality gap between the two, um, I feel like there's they're going to be compared to each other. And um, the if one show's noticeably better, the other show is really going to suffer for it. Even, like, Prodigy's really good. Prodigy's very good. But if Academy is, like, outstanding, if Academy becomes somehow the third show I'll give my little perfect stamp to... 
Prodigy's going to suffer because it's doing a lot of similar things, just not as well. Um, if Prodigy somehow just becomes garbage when Academy hears, same thing, but that, that does seem unlikely. As we continue to explore more of the Star Trek universe, um, bring the fans around the world is the next chapter of this expanding franchise, um, but probably months after America, because that's just how this works. Uh, so these two are leading it. Alex Kurtzman and Nogla um, is a smart and thrilling take that celebrates the core principles of what Star Trek has always stood for, but through the eyes of the next generation of Starfleet leaders. The same quotes we get for every single series, we just have to see how accurate they actually are. Um, I'd be surprised if you've actually written anything for this show as well. Like, it's probably just an outline. Um, you know, and written anything substantial, like written an episode. I, no, no, they did say someone had written the first episode, like past tense. So I assume, you know, if it's even if it's not done, that that pilot, you know, got some focus. Um, yeah, Alex Kurtzman. Um, I'll take him over Rick Berman any what any day, because Alex per Kurtzman just seems like a better person with better beliefs. Um, but I I do notice it's a little unfair to judge him on early discovery because season one was a nightmare. There were like, what, four or five showrunners before Kurtzman? There's really no way season one of Discovery was going to be great. Um, it was probably going to be like pretty good at best. Um, the baby. Then season two of Discovery, as much as it doesn't work on any level, um, it, it feels to me like it exists solely to get Discovery into 32nd Century, which is where Kurtzman wanted it presumably because that's where he sent it and then after season three um what's her name michelle paradise comes aboard and so it's not really kurtzman's work anymore um but but kurtzman's someone who on his own i don't think he produces my favorite trek like at all um i i don't think i've really seen enough and know enough about what actually is kurtzman as opposed to anyone else to judge like judge him really um academy will probably be it honestly like start seeing more trends and what is him versus everyone else um i i think he does a good job in showrunner is showrunner in that he keeps the shows kind of distinct yet connected um regardless of the execution of those shows themselves it, it kind of keeps the universe interesting um, and other than Section 31, I pick, think he picks good concepts so far, um, good shows. Uh, and of course, Nogla, I have nothing, know nothing about you, you'll have to prove yourself to me. Um, you know, I'll have to see what they can do together, so if Nogla is a great, talented writer who can nail Star Trek and nail this vision, then I think this will be a good show, which at worst... Maybe Kurtzman is directly responsible for a lot of the stuff I don't like, and therefore I can kind of see Kurtzman bringing it down a bit, kind of like a episode of Chris Chibnall's Doctor Who written by someone who's not Chris Chibnall, um, or rather written by someone and Chris Chibnall. But um, again, with so many executive producers and stuff, it looks like Alex Coates Kurtzman might be focusing on this, but he has to juggle all the plates as well. Um, I expect this will be a lot of Nogla and less Kurtzman. Uh, for all we know, maybe Kurtzman's even here just because Nogla's new. He's like, I know Star Trek, you know the genre of show we're writing, so let's do it together. Then when you know Star Trek, I'll bounce off or like put someone else on with you. Um, 32nd Century. Yeah, no thing about the settings, but it's... I mean, it's Tilly. Like, it's Tilly at Starfleet Academy. Surely we know this. Um, Tilly, again, early Discovery, I didn't care about anyone. It's hard to remember Tilly in late Discovery. I remember she always had a very cult following. I don't, Not cult, necessarily. That implies that it was a minority. But there was a, definitely a vocal, decently sized, at least, part of the fan base that absolutely adored Tilly. Um, I can't say I ever got to that point, 
Um, I also don't think I can say I was very happy. Like, I was happy when she left, actively. Um, I probably didn't care too much. You can watch my review. <laughs> Go to season three whenever Tilly left. Or season four, which one was it? And you can see how I reacted. Um, but that would be kind of nice, you know, having that recurring character, that, dare I say, classic older character from the other show coming in. Um... I'm certainly not opposed to seeing more Tilly. Mm, now I need a drink that was supposed to be more stealthful. I like, by the way, how again, none of this contradicts my watch order guy that's in the work, but it turns a speculation into all but confirmed. Um, so another little revision is needed. Paramount said to start Production is set to start in 24, uh, so yeah, Black Lady Bird in 25. Um, if you missed it, both Strange New Worlds and Lower Decks were renewed recently, um, and so 2024 has that Lower Decks and Discovery. I disagree that that fills out the 2024 slate. Like, there's room for at least one more, surely. Um... Yeah, Prodigy. Prodigy's missing from that list. And I would imagine Prodigy's next year, given how long it's taken them to make the previous seasons, like maybe half of Prodigy. Um, oh, and the expected second half of Prodigy. So yeah, that rounds out. I mean, 2024 is full. You wouldn't put Prodigy and Academy next to back. They're just too similar. Um, and of course, you need to make the show. So I agree with them. That's like probably a solid year of Trek. Followed by Academy. Uh, and then I do believe, yep, this is someone, I know this name, Tawny Newsom. A comedian writer, I feel like I, isn't that, yeah, Star, isn't that Mariner? Hang on a minute. That's Mariner, right? <laughs> yes. I didn't know Mariner could write. Um, this is very interesting, because I feel like the writer's room would be, like, a pretty kind of full-time gig, and I also feel being Beckett Mariner would be a pretty full-time gig. Um, I hope they're not looking to wrap up Lower Decks any soon, time soon. I mean, of course not. Like, Lower Decks gets a season presumably late this year, early next year, and then it gets another one. Um... Like, it's already been announced that season five. Uh, but good for, good for her. I mean, I hope she's a good writer. I assume since they let her join. Um, she's a capable writer, at least. But, I mean, I guess look at Star Trek V. Um, <laughs> I missed that. That threw me off for a bit. I'm, this is interesting to wonder, though. Um, of course, you could have Star Trek Academy take many tones. It could be funny. It could be dark and serious. Um... The, the coming-of-age story lends itself to certain tones better than others. But I do wonder if um, Picard... Sorry, I've, I've been thrown off. Did Tony Newsom pay for a checkmark? I've been off Twitter since Elon Musk took, took over. But um, did... that? Sorry, that... God, Elon Musk, you've thrown me off again. Um, one of my big complaints with Strange New Worlds is that there is comedy that is both unnecessary and doesn't really fit injected into a lot of scenes. Sometimes it works, sure, but it's too much and often in places it doesn't belong. And the reason it's like that is because the writers of Strange New Worlds um, wanted well, wanted to inject comedy into those scenes. Um, so, I mean, that that's where the wrong decision was made. But they got Mike McMahon in to take scenes they had written and put some jokes in them. Um, and, you know, Mike McMahon did his job, and I, I can tell. Like, having learned that, I can tell where Mike McMahon wrote some scripts in, some jokes in. Not because they're not good, but because they're very Mike McMahon and they really don't fit. Um... My favorite token example is the, I think it is Spock Amok, um, the episode that ends with, what's his face, um, the guy we don't talk about from Star Trek V. 
Oh my god. Alex, Spock's brother. What's his name? Cybok! There it is. Um, yeah, Sp Spock's brain. No, it's not Spock's brain. Spock amok. Um, there's the scene that I'm now doubting is Spock amok, but we're just gonna go on. Where Pike is, like, cooking some meal or something, and two of his officers, I think, like, Una and the security lady are, um, um, like, it's basically the briefing, but because it's Pike, he's more chilled, laid back, he likes to cook, it's in his quarters as he's cooking a meal. Great setup, by the way, I love all that, you know, good, good bit of characterization, that all makes sense. And he's giving the meaning that would traditionally, you know, I mean, it does. The purpose of this scene is to establish the stakes and what's going on, what the mission is. It's a very classic scene. And classically, that'd kind of be the focus of the scene. But in that in that scene of Strange New Worlds, the episode, the folk, um, that should be the focus. The scene should be, here is what's happening in the world. And it's written in a way where that alone is engaging and, like, you're in this meeting kind of with them. You're learning about the scenario. That's enough. That was a good scene. But there are some random, like, jokes and just interruptions about, like, how amazing the potatoes are or whatever that just don't fit and are literally, like, interjected randomly between these other lines. I'm like, yes, these are jokes written for Lower Deck, a scene in Lower Decks, and none of them belong, so none of them work. Um, I have a potential concern that if uh, Tony knew some, that is Tony, right? Not Tawny. Um, but Tony Newsom comes with kind of lower decks in mind of, I mean, they're, they're a Trekkie. I know this. They were very sad not to get to go to deep space nine in the deep space nine episode. Um, but I might be concerned that if maybe they've been in the lower decks world too much, they might be a voice of comedy and end up in like those comedy scenes b being injected where they don't belong in Academy, just like strange new worlds. Um, this is all rampant speculation, of course. Um, it's just a fear that could happen. Um, it is Tawny. Thank you, um, someone who I also need a pronunciation for. Um, that's not an English name. I'm trying to read it like an English name. How about you tell me how it's pronounced? But thank you for the, um, clarification. Tawny, um... That's interesting, though. I hope it goes well for her, and I hope it doesn't mean Lower Decks ends, because I want Tawny to write. <laughs> I wonder if if she's written any, like, Mariner dialogue. Because um, Mariner's great. Like, Mariner's characterized great. She's the main character of Lower Decks. Bodhi. I was gonna say that, and then I forgot what I was gonna say. Thank you, Bodhi. Um, yeah, t Mariner's the main character of Lower Decks. Lower Decks is an ensemble... But it's Lower Decks is a show about the relationship between Mariner and her mother. And if um, Tawny has written any of that dialogue, that is very promising. Um, because Lower Decks' strongest thing is probably characterization and it's writing. It's character-driven writing. So I very hope, much hope... Uh, Tawny can bring some of that to the table as well as a bunch of these all other people I don't really know what they do or um, even like not Landrew what was what was their name um, Londau you know hopefully hopefully they can bring some to the to the table um, but I think that's probably all I have to say about Academy went a little longer than I thought um, I think it's a pretty good experiment uh, I'm learning, maybe it's the time as well, but I don't have enough of an audience just to guarantee an active chat, which I suspected, especially for something like this, like, um, but, yeah, I mean, I of course have concerns that maybe Academy, I don't want to say it can't work, but it is very likely to not work, um, can you tell what I do, by the way, with with my ads but um it's, it's very likely to not work it's ex it's probably more likely to not work than it is to work but i think the setting is a great setup for it um and so as long as you can get like 
good writers with a good vision who know what they want to do and it can execute it well. Um, it could be good. You know, it could be like Lower Decks. I, I'm just surprised. It's like I was cautious, but you nailed it. Um, I'd love, really, like that, that'd be my pitch. Is um, it'd, it'd be awful if I actually wrote it, but I like that premise of like the second founding of the Federation symbolically. It's an Earth, a, a, an Earth, it's a human, a Vulcan, a Tellarite, and an Andorian. Um, I love that idea, but I think that's probably it. Mm. So I am going to wrap up the stream then just flash this. Whoops. Hide that. Flash that so I know when you get caught up. Uh, anyone who wants to interject something, do so now or forever hold your peace. I'm glad they gave me a logo a little late to actually put it in my modern watch order guide. Um, I've already made the graphics and it's too much of an effort to go and do them again. But, yeah, tomorrow we'll be reviewing Picard, Star Trek Picard. If you like this, you'll probably like that a lot better. Episode 7, I hope it's good. I haven't seen it. 7, right? Not 6. Yeah, 7. I know s someone who's in it and I, I, I shouldn't because Memory Alpha put spoilers on their homepage um if you scroll down uh, yep if you there's there's spoilers on there uh bodhi i'm fairly interested but to be honest i'm more looking forward to star trek legacy if they do it i'm not i've talked about this a lot in picard and i don't think i've said these words but star trek legacy is i've seen it pitched basically everyone in picard except the tng characters is basically every character from Picard I don't like. Um, except Seven, who you could go back to. Like, I like Seven and Voyager, but I've talked about this a lot more in Picard. I won't go into too much detail here. Seven of Nine, if you bring her into another series after Picard, will carry over too much of Picard's flawed background picard is very much or rather the um federation of picard is not a utopian federation it is a modern day government um in a in a world um the modern day world and um, i don't like that and if you carry seven of nine over you're gonna bring that with you um shaw is way more liked than i would have thought but I don't like him. He'd have to be seriously, like, reformed, or, like, he'd have to be very deep into a redemption arc for me to even consider the possibility of him being in a show good, and even then, he'll still probably be too much of a dick. Um, Jack's fine, I guess, but the only thing we've kind of seen of him doing him is the scene where he sold weapons to both sides of a planet in a civil war, which is a plot we saw in TNG. Um, I was going to say, that sounds familiar. Yes, it's literally the plot we saw in TNG that literally everybody just saw is the objectively wrong decision, so much so it wasn't even worth debating whether it was good or not because it was just bad and we saw the outcomes and Jack would know about that because Dr. Crusher, who was with Jack at the time, knew that. She was there. She was an integral part of that story and was one of the most vocal about how horrible it was because that's the kind of person Dr. Crusher is. Um, so I don't know. Like, I guess the, the LaForges are fine, but there's not really anything to draw me to them. They're just kind of there. Um, so I would not, uh, I, I don't want Star Trek Legacy. I'd be more inclined for, like, a different... Like, like Star Trek Janeway, for example. As long as it's, like, they took what didn't work about Picard and kind of fix it. It's just, like, a bit after Picard, but instead of the Federation feeling like a modern-day government, it feels like it's actually experienced the previous, like, two or three hundred years of utopia like it could be maybe a bit shaken still because of the D dominion war or like the events of picard or whatever but that federation has not lived through enterprise to tng it, it's a modern day government 
uh, Bodhi, really, I think that's fair. I don't like not David Marcus. Um, who is that? Is that Jack? Um, I'd have to double check. Yeah, not David Marcus. Uh, but Cho has been interesting to me. I think the Federation is, uh, heal, uh, has healing to do after the, the, the problem is it's been like 20 years in a pretty like prosperous 20 years and neither lower decks nor prodigy show scarring um even like cardassia i think this is a fault of lower decks by the way but even cardassia is like kind of business as usual from what we see in lower decks um my main problem with shaw is first off opinion i did i saw a great reddit post i went over in one of my reviews of someone who loves shaw and explained why because it, it helped me really understand first off opinion i don't like watching a dick be a dick i just i'm never gonna like that in entertainment and a lot of the praise i see is they find it fun seeing someone just be a dick to their legacy characters i don't get that and i never will that's opinion. I recognize that, but it's one of the reasons I don't like Shaw. The other is his traumatic event of um, Wolf 359 was like 20 years, 20 plus years before Picard. And I can't accept, maybe if his traumatic event was the Dominion War, I would get it, even though it's about the same distance. But like, it's hard to imagine that Starfleet never interjected into this guy um, who... It's not just, like, emotional problems that could theoretically compromise his ability to command, but, like, he's extremely racist to, like, the ex-Borg. And, like, this... They give him Borg on his ship. Like, what? Um, they... It just feels negligent. It... it so he doesn't really work for me um, because of the gap that was there. And again, that could be opinion. Maybe you don't care. Uh, like it Again, it would work if it was 2023. If it was 2040, it would work. But because it's like the 24th century and it started at Wolf 359, I feel like there should have been something to heal. And he knows he's a dick. He knows he's a dick and that's bad, but he's not really doing anything about it. Um, a lot of my problems, not a lot, but many of my problems with um, to tonal problems and plot problems with Picard have been it's the fact that it's supposed to be the 25th century. Uh, Miranda B., I want Elnor to meet Worf. I need it. I want Elnor to geek out about weapons with Worf and in general do something other than beat people up and give Rafi trauma. That could be interesting. I am not opposed to Elnor getting more to do. Uh, my problem with Elnor is he exists basically... I'm going to just move it over to here. He exists so that... Um, he exists because of absolute candor the season one episode that episode fully serves the point of elnor and his character is kind of complete so much so that in the very next episode the show gets rid of elnor um because he's not needed and then he shows up in the finale to like cry a bit like he doesn't really serve a purpose in season two his purpose was already done in season one so they just like kill him off and to bring him back at the end. Like, Elnor doesn't serve a purpose in Picard. That's why he's not in it. But if you put him in a new show, you could absolutely give him a purpose and make him a really engaging character. He was a really good character in Absolute Candor. He just didn't have a purpose after that point in Picard. And so it, it was like, it kind of felt like, why is he here to me? But I'd love it if, I'd, I'd probably love Elnor, actually. You're right. If you give Elnor stuff to do, he, um, I think he's a good character from Picard and his absolute candor makes for an interesting character trait and leads to interesting scenarios. Uh, Bode, World War II in our world work, I assume, has created... Whoa, where is this going? World War II in our world has created ripples of, of ripples in our society. If we think about uh, yeah, war in that lens, imagine that on the scale in the billions is how I imagine the Dominion War and the Borg attacks. I agree. 
that the Federation should not be business as usual immediately after the Dominion War. If you really, again, I'd recommend my Picard talks about this, but um, in Deep Space Nine, the Federation is in, like, the government itself, the higher-ups of the government, the Federation, um, always held to those utopian ideals no matter how bad they got. Sometimes, maybe even often, in, like, the depths of the war, they really wondered if they would get through it. Um, and I think one, the best parts of, like, maybe the commentary in Deep Space Nine is the Federation would be like, we're going to win this war and we're not going to, we're going to stick to our ideals. And then organizations like Section 31 um, were integral in, thic- in so- like winning the war, but are not those ideals. And when it comes to the boots in the ground, like the actual captains like Cisco um, and presumably others, uh, what the Admiral we see who kind of works with Section 31, um, they're like, I don't think we can win this by the book, so I'm going to do this other thing that's kind of shady. And so it's kind of like the Federation can keep its clans clean or kind of like it turns a blind eye, but the, like, boots on the ground get really weary of it. Um, If Lower Decks and Prodigy didn't show us, like, a return to normal so quickly after the Dominion War, I would be more inclined to accept a Picard but I feel like after the Dominion War ended it's a time of rebuilding but like well, not, let's use in World War II the example you picked when World War II ended there was no breathing room immediately there were the Soviets right up against Europe um, you know where kind of the focus of the world war was and we were right into a different kind of war, but very much like literally there are two people in this world who could hit a button and end the world. Um, there was no break. And, you know, arguably, I mean, if you happen to live in Germany, things got better, but arguably things got worse overall um, than during World War II. Um in Star Trek, when you defeat the Dominion War, the Dominion don't give a shit about the Alpha Quadrant anymore. They want to go sleep on their planet, and, like, they just want to go be changelings. The Alpha Quadrant, every major power is in no position to make a move against the others, and the three major powers of Earth, Klingons, and Romulans are allied. Like, they they wouldn't want to go against each other. And so you can, especially as like a high up government, get back to what was the previous century of utopia. Um, You know, Janeway in Starfleet Eyes, the end of Voyager was the end of the Borg as far as they know. Um, And so it makes it much more easier when lower decks in Prodigy show a very much normal Starfleet, something we'd more expect from the 24th century before um, Wolf 359, that even if the Federation isn't fully recovered, like, it's changed. Starfleet is more militaristic. Their ships are more armed and stuff. The Dominion War had an effect. The Borg had an effect, everything. But um, the Federation should still understand the values of its ideals and its utopian Nism, whereas not only does Picard feel like a regression or like a failing federation, it literally feels like a modern day government to me. Um, and I can't see you having utopia and deciding that modern day government is better. Even if you don't know how to get utopia back, you should still be better than where Picard is. Um, and a lot of the things in Picard, like, um, um, Shaw's trauma at Wolf 359, like, uh, the stuff with Picard when he was a kid and stuff, all take place firmly in the utopia kind of era. 
And so I think it's, even if it should be bad, it's worse than it should be. But even if it wasn't great, it feels weird to show Lower Decks and Prodigy and say, and then we got worse because of the war. It's like, well, <laughs> what was that? What's Lower Decks? Like, I did they have amnesia? What happened? Um, you know. Uh, the... Bo Bodhi, we also did not see Before the War and Paradise Lost of Season 4 uh, of a paranoid Starfleet and nearly a coup. I think changelings in the Borg are the Federation's lost century. It really shocked people. Th that's a great example because the thing I always love about um, uh, Paradise Lost, you can bend the Federation. Absolutely. Most, many of the best stories are when you bend the Federation. Um, you can have individuals go too far, but the Federation can't break. What Paradise Lost was, was the Federation briefly succumbing to paranoia. Um, and that had a shock where it stood up and realized what was happening. And it went, no. There is a very real possibility that literally anybody you see is a changeling and is out to destroy this planet. But... If we, we will take necessary security precautions, like it, you know, the president, the Starfleet Academy, whatever, you know, we'll take precautions. But if we let ourselves succumb to that suspicion and stuff, we will destroy Earth and we refuse. We refuse to come to that suspicion. And that's why, you know, with the, the ending scene where everyone's business is normal and Odo is like, what the hell are you doing? Like, there is still changeling out there. Nothing has changed. And like, yes, I know. And if we accept that, we will destroy the Federation. Um, and by actively refusing to accept that, we are are working towards defeating that it's it's a it's a world who's learned who's learned the lessons of red scare who's learned those lessons and often needs a reminding like you uh, morality often needs a good kick up the ass like especially in utopia i'm sure but the the federation after the dominion war in picard is one that is worse than the federation ever got in the dominion war in his regress to the point of now. And it also feels like the rest of the galaxy has. It feels like a current government who is living in the world now. Where there are many flaws that could potentially end the world. And even though they're probably not going to. There's still that kind of era of well this is just how the world is. And... It's it's worse than Deep Space Nine ever was, is the thing. And that, it just doesn't work. You can bend the Federation, but you can't break it. And Picard broke the Federation. Uh, Bodhi, we don't have galaxy politics, to be honest, but I imagine it's a Cold War situation between the Dominion and the Federation after the war. That's not really what it was, though. Like... You know, the the changelings don't care about the solids. Like, the only reason the Dominion exists is so the solids won't actively pursue, like, prosecute changelings. The changelings kind of have that order and control. And the changelings don't even really run the Dominion. They got other people. They delegate it. Like, the Vorta and the Jem'Hadar run the Dominion day to day. Um, the Alpha Quadrant was a new threat to the Dominion that they wanted to bring under their control when it failed, and they realized for the first time ever, a changeling had harmed another. Like, their 100 experiment has failed. The changelings realized that, like, they'd made a mistake, and all the changelings want to do is live in peace in the Great Link on their rock. That's all they want. They don't want to invade the Federation. Um, they got Odo back. That's what they want. There's no reason for the Cold War scenario. The Federation doesn't want to debate the Dominion. And the Dominion would probably prefer the Federation in the Dominion. But because the Federation doesn't want to attack, there's no real reason to go after them. Um, I don't see a Cold War scenario. In fact, from Picard... 
the last season, we know that it was an extremist small group that broke away and had that amnesty for the solids. Starfleet explicitly knows because of Odo that the Dominion has no interest in the Alpha Quadrant. Um... Bodhi, I agree. I think the Federation is presented as like a failing state. There needs to be a jolt that changes things socially and morally if a Federation survives centuries on. I wouldn't say it's a failing state in that it's going to collapse. Um, it's a state that I wouldn't be surprised if it collapsed in like 100 or 200 years if it weren't for Discovery. But it... It, it really feels like a modern-day country and a modern-day world. It's just instead of the world, it's the galaxy. Um, and that's not where it should be in that century. I'm not even sure that's where anyone should be. Maybe the Romulans? You could justify being um, pretty down and pessimistic for obvious reasons. Um, but it's hard to imagine anyone, like, especially the Federation like that and so what i want if you just get rid of that like it's just the federation it, it doesn't feel like a modern day country that's what i why i want picard to end and something else to take its place is so you can work on the backdrop because it's a bit too late i think to really fix the backdrop of picard um but yeah that was a nice little half hour tangent um we i did not expect to go on um if you want to hear more about my opinions on picard much more in depth tomorrow at 3 p.m pst pacific standard time uh an hour before this stream started i will be reviewing episode seven i hope it was good um i haven't seen it i don't watch it I, until like 10 minutes before i go live but um yeah i'm the good news is I highly doubt Star Trek Academy will be all of the problems I just described. Because that's not the 32nd century, and that's not really what Academy would be. Your show about, like, Starfleet Academy wouldn't be this is a failing state and we need to fix it. That's, that'd be weird. And also, surely Section 31 takes up that role. Like, I'm very aware that Section 31 would probably replace Picard, because thematically that makes so much sense. Um, you're losing your darker, more adult drama, and you have a spy show about the ethically dubious Section 31 like that's just that's obvious i don't want there to be that kind of darker show but it's an obvious replacement carlos uh let's see what has been turned upside down uh the vulcans has an extremist experiment changing's romulan empire a sundered i think you might have made a few typos and i'm struggling to get the meeting um who are the extremist Vulcans? I don't remember that in the Dominion War. I know there have been extremist Vulcans because one of the great, the people who understand the Vulcans realize that you can explain anything with logic. Um, it's very easy. You just need the right set of preconditions. Um, you can logic your way in or out of anything, and therefore the Vulcans are not just inherently good. Um... But I don't remember that plot line in <laughs> Deep Space Nine. And, but, like, even if all this is true, even if all this is true, um, that the Federation should not be, like, early TNG because of the Borg and the Dominion War and stuff. Um, first, it's weird that Lower Decks and Prodigy are showing what they're showing, but that would be problems with those shows. And the problem with Picard isn't that the Federation is damaged. It's that it is far worse than it ever was in Deep Space Nine. And if you're telling me the Federation is damaged because of the Borg and the Dominion and all of the stuff that happened from like Wolf 359 to all good things, not all good things, um, what we left behind, then 
I don't see how the Federation can be worse than the state it was in at the end of Deep Space Nine. Um, which, I'll admit, wasn't great, but I, I did never left Deep Space Nine with the thought of, like, well, let's just give up, you know? That, that was never the impression I got at the end of Deep Space Nine. Um, it was like, man, we're all tired, but that's over, and we can go back to being the Federation. Like, that's kind of the vibe I got. Um, in 20 years later, I would have hoped that at least at the highest levels of government that we're operating on, maybe some of the boots on the ground are worn, like who actually fought in the war. Although I'd note that Picard and crew are not at all worn, even though they did fight in the war. Um, they, they fought over like Bat Betazoid, didn't they? <laughs> Which like you think Troy would be pretty attached to the invasion of Betazoid, but, um, yeah, it, it just, so that doesn't work, and also, just as entertainment, even if it makes sense, it's not what I want to watch, unless you have perfection-level writing of Deep Space Nine, which you don't have, but to be fair, like, no one does, as I said at the start of this stream, there are only two shows I've given my perfection award to. So I'd be very impressed if you had Deep Space Nine level writing. Uh, Bodie not having consistency across shows is also a Star Trek thing. I, I'm going to firm disagree there. With some notable exceptions, sure, like TOS, I'm going to firm disagree. And Prodigy being inherently hopeful kind of has to ignore the dark aspects. Lower Decks is also a very pre-boring TNG type um, romp going places. Um, Prodigy is a show about child slaves. I'm just gonna put that out there. I don't think Prodigy dances around the dark aspects. I think Prodigy is a show about child slaves. Um, <laughs> like, discovering hope, but also child slaves. Um, TNG... The thing is, early TNG, like season one to like Wolf 359, is the Federation after a hundred years of peace. Um, the biggest threat, the Klingon Empire, is their ally. And the Romulan Empire's kind of disappeared going God knows what on the other side of their empire. Um, like, that's why the Enterprise D is a cruise liner in space. It is a century of utopia and prosperity. Um... Wolf 359 was the first slap in the face that, like, hey, if something goes wrong, you're not prepared. And then, like, uh, I think as Barclay says, every major power challenges the Federation in the next, like, five years. Um, you know, we, we see Starfleet um, ships become more militarized. They're much more strategic. They're no longer cruise liners in space. And that should continue. Absolutely. The ships should remain more militaristic and armed. Even like the Titan, a science ship, can really hold its own and has a lot of tactical um, battle considerations. Um, but yeah, the, the Borg, the Cardassians, the Dominion, like that seriously changes the Federation and it should operate, it should be more defensive, it should be more prepared for conflict despite wanting to avoid it. There should be differences. Um, Starfleet perhaps should be even, there should be more talk of Starfleet as a military than the scientists who could become a military if we needed it. Um, that all makes sense. Um, but it would be weird if TNG was Deep Space Nine Federation, because there's been a hundred years of absolutely no reason to need that. Like, even then, TOS was kind of calm. Like, if you were firmly in the Federation, after the Dis Klingon War with Discovery, there wasn't really much big. Like, it was pretty chill. Um, the, the, dis like, the Klingon War and Discovery is probably the only significantly threatening event between the founding of the Federation and Wolf 359. Um, off the top of my head. So, 
yes, TNG, especially early on, is that romp going places, but late TNG deals with the threat of the Borg. Late TNG, and like the movies, brush up against the Federation during the Dominion War. They brush up against the Federation that needs to be more prepared and is coming more prepared, and we see that. The Enterprise is not dealing with any of that, um, at least not on screen, but we can see the changes in the Starfleet around it. Um, most notably in First Contact, when the newest ships are all specifically designed to fight the Borg, and then they're prepared to fight the Dominion. The Enterprise E is a battleship. Like, it's a proper battleship. It's claustrophobic. It's, it's, written, it's designed to be a strong, imposing military ship. Um, but because the Enterprise doesn't really deal with that, with the time we see him on screen, like, no, it, it's not going to be Deep Space Nine. Um, there was the Zindi conflict and the Unseen Romulan War before TOS. I did say between the founding of the Federation, which takes place right after the Romulan War, but yes... Um, the Romulan War was the biggest threat. Um, obviously, that would have a strong effect on the early Federation. I think that's why Discovery is much more militaristic. Is Let's not forget, the Federation was born out of war. The Federation exists as a Federation and not like a coalition or something because the Romulans declared war. And everyone was like, oh shoot, maybe we should work more to, like together. Like, at the time of the war, um, uh, the coalition existed. Like, the coalition of planets. And then the Romulan War made everyone go, like, right, let's make this a federation. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna pretend it was easy. But, like, if you lived on Earth, there wasn't really much to threaten you. If you were in that core of the federation. If you were on the outskirts, sure, you know, but the core... In, like, anyone's homeworld, Earth, Vulcan, Andor, and stuff, that probably would have been pretty chill, except the Klingon War. Um, forgot there was United Earth, not the Federation, yeah. Um, it's still Starfleet, but, um, I intentionally chose a point in time after the Romulan War. I will give you that. But, you know, it's, it's basically, like, the Federation was founded the year after the war ended. Um, it's basically the same date. Um, so yeah, what, what, what the consistency to me is, is keep a prepared Starfleet. The Cerritos shouldn't be ready to go off to war. That's not what the Cerritos does, but like the Protostar, you know, should, the Titan should, all the ships should be more militaristic and they are. I'm not a fan of Picard's era of ship design in general, but I like how they kind of maintain that ready for the next war um exteriors you know they they look like the federation's not going to get caught with its pants down if the borg or the federation or the the um dominion show up you know they're they're ready but they're not actively acting like a military they're just ready to be a military at the drop of a hat that makes sense um becoming a like pessimistic accepting that the world's just awful and there's nothing you can do kind of modern day government is not um continuity in my mind uh, this was gonna be a short live stream <laughs> mm. what i've learned is should i just like randomly if there's not an episode of star trek go live on Saturday, and just trust that we'll talk about something Star Trek. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess you could fault that the um, Lower Decks, ship-wise, is much more TNG, like pre-First Contact. Um, the Lower Decks fleet doesn't feel ready for war, but... You could also argue it's not the ships that are going to war. You know, the Cerrito shouldn't be a warship. Um, you know, if anything, that might actually be a criticism that Lower Decks follows off of the TNG ships, not 
the Deep Space Nine ships, the First Contact ships. Um, I'm, I'll even probably say it. I love those ships, but you know that that's Lower Decks taking a maybe tone decision over what might make sense for the universe. Um, but I think it works enough because it's the Lower Deck ships. You know, you're not going to send your Oberth to fight the Klingon War. You're just not going to do it. But hey, that'd be fun. I watch a lot of your Eagle Moss ship reviews, live streams. Would be fun just to talk Trek. The episode reviews. Um, I don't know if you're just a lurker. I don't. I don't recognize you from the streams. Um, the Cerritos is a joke. Seriously, yes, it is. Uh, the Cerritos is intentionally designed to not be a very good design, but over time you fall in love with it. I. I I, I might fish out my Eagle Moss book, um, but there was a quote with Mike McMahon where that's basically the, the Cerritos is not to be supposed to be a good looking ship, but it's not supposed to be a bad looking ship. It's supposed to be a ship that eventually looks good because you've grown to like it. Um, that's that's kind of what it is. But yeah, I say the um, the we Saturday reviews are like maybe an hour actually reviewing the episode and we do have tangents and then like an hour afterwards that some sort of star trek talk um related to the episode sure but this sort of thing about like what actually is continuity between deep space nine as picard is absolutely something that we would talk about after reviewing the episode like 100 percent Carlos, I'm a ship guy. There's no love for me. None. I like the Cerritos. But when I saw it at first, I was one like, huh. I think I like it, but I don't know. That was kind of, I think that was my reaction. And the more I saw it, I'm like, yeah, I like it. I, I do. And now I love the Cerritos. It's, I, I do. Um, but it's not supposed to be a good looking ship, like intentionally. Uh, Bodhi, fairly new to your channel, yeah, but I try to catch your live stream when I can. I am glad you enjoy them. Uh, and of course, there's always the VODs if you're into that. Um, but yeah, this was a little experiment. I like it. It's good. These sort of things are always good with chat engagement, and I can bounce off, and we can discover, like, exactly the continuity problems between Deep Space Nine and Picard for me. Um, that's why I love sometimes checking out the Reddit. Of like the Alex, I can't live stream this audio. <laughs> um, your headphones are unplugged. Um, but yeah, the the there was a Reddit post where I loved like I hate Captain Shaw, but I wanted desperately wanted someone who loved Captain Shaw to sit down and tell me why they loved Captain Shaw, so I could kind of get it like. Why does he work for you? Because I was very curious. And why doesn't he work for me? I, those are some of my favorite things. I love Spock's brain. And once I literally asked the Reddit, I love Spock's brain. I want you to explain to me why you don't like it so I can understand. Uh, that's I'm sure that'll be a video one day. Is why Spock's brain is actually great. But um, it is. I know I've, I can't end the live stream before seeing people react to that. Um, Alex, you want to tell people how good Spock's brain is? Oh, it is an excellent episode that just proves Spock is the best character, and if y'all disagree, you can, we can set up a spot to meet and fight. I'm not sure it proves Spock is the best character, because he actually isn't really in that episode a lot. There's a reason <laughs> they had to choose him of all the people. But, he, I, 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 it's a, it's peak TOS. If you don't like TOS, you're not gonna like Spock's brain. But if you like TOS, you're gonna love Spock's brain. Like, like I, I just don't understand how people hate it. Unless you don't like TOS, in which case, fair. It's very TOS, but you it's probably do. It's also very Spock's brand. I think I like it because it's very colorful and campy. That's TOS. So, like, if you like what TOS does, you should love Spock's brain, in my mind. But, like, I get Spock's brain isn't for everyone, it's just, if you're in season three of TOS, you probably like it, you know? <laughs> oh, Bodai, Spock's brain is actually the best. Yes, we've done it. <laughs> you're the best, you're the best fan, Bodai. You're now, I officially award you the best fan award. Congratulations, Alex. Clap for Bodai. 
They like Spock's brain. They say it's the best. Oh, um, good. Finally, somebody who has a brain. <laughs> Um, I mean, it could be Spock's But not brain, Spock. Was... Spock didn't have a brain, ironically, in that episode. Um, well, he did. It was just... It was somewhere there. else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Alex, on their birthday one year, is going to be just... I let I give them a video to just talk about how good Spock's brain is. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if that, that could probably be a live stream. Because if I, like, hype it up as well, I bet I could get enough people to make that interesting... Where, like, you just have to argue with them that Spock's brain is good. And then when somebody says, it sucks, change my mind, I just end the stream. <laughs> yeah, BP, there we go. Carlos is celebrating, too. Best fan. Um, the thing is, I, it will be a video, and it's real tangential. I won't go into here. But in general, the reasons people didn't like Spock's brain... It's because they're wrong. Well, it Objectively. was... Primarily... It was kind of that they found the whole premise unbelievable. <laughs> Bodhi, I'd like to thank my fans, my mother, Spock, and his brain. Yes, let's all thank Spock and his brain. Well, like, people found the premise unbelievable, and I'm like... Really? Out of well, everything in any TOS, other show, but like... That's what you find unbelievable? That is perhaps the most believable sci-fi concept. Like, half of the... Like, they kind of, I asked them then further, like, can you list exactly what you don't find believable? And there's like five things that have to happen to that episode for that episode to happen. All involved with basically removing a brain and put it in, putting it back in. And like three of those things are already possible. So it's like, you can remove a brain. You can have a body survive without a brain. Um, or at least not like based off machines. You can preserve a brain at least for a little bit and like it's not doesn't seem like much of a logical leap that in like two three hundred years it'd be better like it's the the only hard part to believe is that mccoy could surgically re-implant spock's brain but he had special alien knowledge so like as long as it's theoretically possible to do it and these aliens could theoretically have learned how I don't see how the episode's so unbelievable as a premise. I, it's it's baffling. I'd love a JXE style Spock's brain. That's what I do. All right, fans, here I keep pointing you to JXE. That's your goal now, is to go flood JXE, and somehow get them to me, and then I can force JXE to make a video about why Spock's brain is great. I don't even know if JXE likes Spock's brain, but it, we're gonna do it. <laughs> that's that's now the new life goal is to meet JXE and do a video about Spock's brain. <laughs> Cause either way, I think that that'd be that'd be fun. <laughs> and then chat's like, "Who's JXE? Carlos, you should know who JXE is. You've been in enough streams where I've thrown you at JXE. They did a new video about plot holes. It's good, JXE." Put him into YouTube. She's great. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Did, did, you, did you like that joke where I, every time I said Harry Potter, I said trans rights? That came from that JXE video. I stole it. <laughs> but, no, yeah. I think, as much as I love talking about these, um, it's been an hour and a half. Most of that has not been about Starfleet Academy. And I do need a voice for tomorrow. Um, for Star Trek Picard. Hmm. Hopefully the episode is not ruined by the, um, Memory Alpha spoiler, which was worse, because I saw it, and I went, why is, it, there's, like, under Picard, it had a bunch of recommended links. I'm like, why is this a link under Picard? And I dumbly clicked it, expecting to go to their page, and it was a page... I don't know if you've seen it. Um, if you haven't, if you don't absolutely don't want Picard spoiled, leave. 
I'm not going to spoil it, but not knowing what the ep- is in the episode, maybe I will. I, it was a character was linked under spa- under Picard. I was like, why are you linked here? And I clicked it stupidly, thinking I'd go to their page. And I went to the page of that character, and in parentheses it said changeling. So I'm like, oh, I really hope a core part of this episode does not involve knowing that this character is a changeling. <laughs> like... Ugh, that, that's gonna be rough um but yeah spock's brain says trans rights yep um and colise smith theft you were terrible um but jxc is kind of like what i do but better thought out and also i do live reactions 10 minutes after i've watched an episode they spend like months to years working on very deep dives and analysis and like most of what i my insights to this sort of thing come from watching jxc um hi if you like me i'm sure you'll love jxc especially if you like doctor who because they got a lot of doctor who episodes they're also a trekkie but i don't think they've really done trekkie stuff um not really at least so they're five-hour Doctor Who. If you like Doctor Who, um, and especially if you liked Doctor Who, didn't like Chris Chibnall, and don't really know why, um, maybe you can say bad writing but don't know why, go watch JXE's five-hour Doctor Who review. Even if you don't like Doctor Who, it's still, like, amazing and funny and a really deep insight into, like, writing and writing for a franchise that's like 60 years old and has so much change and stuff like doctor who and star trek are different but they're they're similar in a lot of ways like star trek characters don't regenerate but the shows change and the casts change and the producers change um i'm probably gonna watch jxe videos after this if i'm being honest Carlos Smith, I did love Doctor Who, but no more. At what point, I'm curious, Carlos, before we sign off, where did you drop off? And also, did you watch the classics? That's an interesting question. Um, I did. I would have been one of those people who dropped off after Capaldi. Um, I gave up, I think, on Kill the Moon. But it was after a binge from, like, the first Doctor that, um... I was like, it means so much to me, and I'm so invested, I'm gonna give it one more episode. And that next episode, I think it's like, is it Time Heist, or is it Mummy? I don't remember, but it suddenly, all of the problems I had with Peter Capaldi's Doctor went away, and just weren't there anymore. And uh, I enjoyed it, like, (laughs) classics, yes, um... And then Jody. Only reason I've seen all of Jody is the podcast Fuck Yeah Doctor Who. Great podcast. A bunch of writers, well, two writers who um, sat down because they loved Doctor Who. They sat down at the start of Jodie's era. Um, they loved the first episode. And then every other episode is basically an amazing breakdown of why, um, exactly why the writing falls short. I mean, there are some they liked. But um, I stopped watching Doctor Who with a companion podcast and started watching a podcast that made me watch Doctor Who. That's that's also very good. Um, and some good insights into like... Because especially before then, there were a lot more times where I went, I don't like this and this didn't work, but I don't know why. I can't understand. Oh no. Are there kids invading? Hi, so so. Hi, I will. Hi, Roe. Hi. I gotta go get this thing. Uh, my hi. nephews hi. have hi. just invaded the bedroom. Hi. Do you want to say hi to the internet, so so? Do you want to say Spock's brain is good? Okay. You want to say anything? He's quiet. You can't touch that. That's the microphone. Um, yeah, Carlos. But after the new doctor, uh, Female by the seventh episode. Oh, so by Jody. Um, I simply stopped uh, of her first season. I was afraid for a moment you stopped because she was female, but then I realized you didn't know her name. Um, list of Doctor Who episodes. I actually want to check. What was seven? Uh, 
13th. I don't think I would have given up after her first season, but I definitely would have made it wouldn't have made it far in the second. Oh, Kerblam! That's a reasonable episode to give up on. Um not bad, but also fundamentally mischaracterizes the doctor, so it's not bad. I mean, season one was the best season of hers, which isn't saying much, but, um, yeah. All right, I think I should go and deal with the toddlers that have invaded the bedroom. So, so, do you want to say Spock's brain is good? Trans rights? Can you say hi? Say hi, so, so. <laughs> All right, well, I'm, you forgot her name on purpose. That's not fair to Jody. Oh, no. It's Jib, no. <laughs> Yep. Bye. Yep. I'm gonna take care of it. So uh, I'm gonna say bye, and uh, I'll see you next time. Yep.